and we certainly do live in interesting times, and it is rather difficult to come up with anything that is humorous and appropriate under these circumstances because these times are truly interesting and truly deadly. <clears throat> we are confronted with an enemy the likes of which the U.S. has never faced before. And we all know that Osama bin Laden and his organization are far outside the bounds of what any of us would call civilization. They are evil, but they are also weird. It's spelled different ways, but this is the name of their organization. And we know that they are weird and that they do not abide by civilized rules because we were all taught that Q is always followed by the letter U. So that should be an indication as just how far off they are from us. I want to make, take the opportunity to do what I generally do not do at these luncheons and make a couple of observations about the, uh, the situation. <clears throat> These terrorists are not as smart as the communists that we faced for decades. There's considerable comment in the news media that the U.S. is never prepared to be involved in a long conflict. Well, the communists understood this, and during the Korean War, which I can remember, and folks of my generation and older can remember. And during the Vietnam War, which more of us can remember, they had, the communists had, absolutely they had the power to do violence and terrorism inside the United States. They had the power to crash planes into buildings. They had the power to blow up stadiums full of people. They absolutely had the power to do it, but they didn't do it. And now why did not they do that? They were smart. And they hoped that the American people would tire of combating them, and they knew that if they struck us in the United States, that the American people were not going to tire of it. Now. I think that there was a terrible misjudgment on the part of these terrorists. I really believe they misjudged the circumstances. Trying to get into their heads, you know that they are not stupid. They're just not highly intelligent and they don't reason well. They probably expected that the Bush administration would respond as the Clinton administration had responded, but even more so. I think that what they expected was that by now there would have been carpet bombings all over Afghanistan and that the killing of a huge numbers of innocent people would have enabled them and their agents who are in other Muslim countries to go to the streets and overturn governments. I suspect that Osama bin Laden hoped that the reaction to the U.S. reaction was going to be sufficient to overturn the Saudi government, maybe overturn the Pakistani government, overturn governments in the, uh, uh, of the smaller nations around the Persian Gulf, and uh, and enable bin Laden and his friends to now have absolute control of countries that have a lot of wealth and huge populations. But that is not how the United States has reacted and rather than carpet bombing Afghanistan, President Bush has been appearing on television with Muslim clergy who have anathematized, if that is a good term in the, in the, if, from the Catholic Church to apply to Muslims, anathematized the, uh, the terrorists. 
obviously we're going to do military action. All of this stuff that's going on is not a uh, is not just show, and the Secretary of Defense is going to four countries in the region, and he's not going to be there to discuss long-term exchanges of military training. He's there. They're planning action, and there will be action, but my guess is that it's going to be done in such a way as to focus on and eliminate the terrorists and those who have harbored them, and done in such a way that it will be not, it will be perceived not as a, a uh, an overreaction on our part, but as an absolutely appropriate reaction. And so that's going to happen. I think that's safe to predict. It's also safe to predict that the extremist terrorists will respond to this by taking additional action in the United States, and I'm quite confident that they have the capability of doing that as they have, as terrorists have demonstrated, uh, all somebody has to do is strap explosives on them and go into a restaurant and blow it up. That happens to the Israelis all the time, and these people that we're dealing with are of the same mindset. So they're going to they are going to respond when the Taliban government falls, which it will. They're going to respond with more terrorism in the United States. How, what, what it's going to be, I don't know. They may have played their best card already, although we have many vulnerabilities in an open society. The one thing that I do predict, however, is almost as certain as the uh, morning follows the night is that these actions against the United States will harden the resolve of the American people to continue the effort to, if not exterminate terrorism, reduce it to an absolute minimum. So I think this is a different kind of conflict. I think that they have misjudged the United States I think we have a president who has demonstrated enormous um, calm, reserve, and intelligence in how he is proceeding. And I think at the end of the uh, of the th this conflict, things are going to get better. They have not destroyed the United States, although it's impacted everybody. I grew up in Baton Rouge, and my mother still lives there, and three houses down from our house is the Lamana family. He, Mr. Lamana is a, is a druggist. Um, one of his children was a military officer in the Pentagon who was killed when the plane crashed into the Pentagon. All over America, if people don't know folks directly, as my mother does, they know people who know folks. This has impacted the country and things are changing in the United States. And we had a meeting here uh, that we hosted you know, on Monday with nine or ten groups that ha uh, conservative groups that have outreach on college campuses. We met in these rooms here on this floor, discussing what is happening, and and it's beyond any of our experience. Um, the left, on, which has been triumphant on campus and piped up and said some outrageous things, is now groveling and apologizing. A professor who said uh, in the, at the University of Mexico, and we got the first word of this, one of our graduates reported that this professor had said, anybody who bombs the Pentagon gets my vote. She said, what should I do? And we said, sunshine is a good disinfectant. Take, take this information to the news media, to the state legislature, to tours and others, and the roof sort of caved in on this professor, and 24 hours later he was apologizing, he was groveling. Uh, it turns out, uh, somewhat to my surprise, that he was not a committed leftist, he was of a libertarian bent, but he realizes what a dumb thing he said, and he is apologizing. And schools and left-wing groups have said things and done things which uh, have caused enormous revulsion. And uh, I was in a, in a, uh, by accident, I had to eat lunch last week uh, in Seattle before I saw a donor, and I went on a street called Broadway that has an enormous concentration of people with body piercings and tattoos and 
black leather with collars with spikes on them and everything and um, and I, I'd never seen quite such a concentration even in Berkeley, California. I sat there eating my pizza in a restaurant and a guy came by and he had and I, it, it, it really looked weird. His hair was about this long. He was uh, apparently uh, light blonde hair and he had uh, not purple or green or whatever colors as many of them did or spikes. He, it was all about this long and he had uh, the red streaks along here and along here and along the middle, and I said, that is really ridiculous. Well, uh, look, what on earth? I mean, I've seen many things, and th that was kind of weird, and I ate my meal, and I got in my car, and I had to drive around the block, and I was traveling on the same direction that this guy was walking a block ahead, and I saw in the back he had a, a you know, in his hair, a blue rectangle with a white star, those red stripes, and the, uh, he was, th even this hippie was showing uh, an American flag motif. I'm telling you, things are, are changing in this country, and we are uh, working particularly on college campuses to take advantage of this, because I think the uh, uh, conservative principles are, are, have an opportunity that uh, we haven't had for a long time. Uh, we've been on the defensive for generations on the college campuses. I think we have the opportunity now to go on the offensive. So far this year, the Leadership Institute has trained 2,464 students in 95 schools. And we are approaching and will soon reach, with considerable fanfare, I hope, our 30,000th student to be trained by the Leadership Institute. This year we have trained we have placed 91 job seekers through our employment placement program. And you have before you our 2001 school schedule. Take a moment to review the calendar and consider attending one of our programs or look at the topics and suggest these programs to people you know who would benefit from them. And now I want to introduce to you Audrea Van for the invocation and uh, Pledge of Allegiance. She's an intern in our uh, grassroots department here at the Leadership Institute. She's a recent graduate of Dallas Baptist University with a degree in English and Communications. Um, during that time she also worked for uh, Northrop Grumman in Human Resources, Employee Management, and Organizational Development. Audrey was born in Colorado, as was I, but as the child of a U.S. Army chaplain, she was raised all over the southern portion of the United States. Um, she's called the Rose Among the Thorns by her mother because Audrey is the only girl in a family who also includes five boys. Uh, she says that the recent terrorist attacks have, have um, been even more meaningful to her because of an incident that occurred during her father's two years in Greece. Right before her family was to return to the United States, the bus that her father usually rode uh, to work was bombed by terrorists. And uh, at that time, as it happened, her father was home packing. But the soldier who took her father's usual seat was struck by a shard of metal which lodged in his brain. It was quite frightening for young Andrea, who was then a second grader, to realize that it could have been her father. Andrea? Please join with me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this beautiful morning that you gave us and that then for the beautiful mornings that you will continue to do so even though they'll be just a little cooler than we're used to. I want to thank you right now for every individual who came here this morning to share in this time of fellowship and, and eating this wonderful breakfast. And I want to come to you right now and pray for Congressman Royce that you will anoint his words and prepare our hearts and open our ears for what he has to share with us because I know it's going to be very important and we're all going to really want to pay attention. I pray too for the continued, um, well just for, for our leaders right now in this time of turbulence that you will be with them and, and you will guard their hearts and, and give them words and give them encouragement and give them strength to see our nation through this time. I thank you for what you've done, for what you will continue to do, and I thank you for this great country that you've allowed me to be born into. In your name I pray. Amen.
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Andre. And now I present to you Mike Krampaski for an update on the, act, uh, on the uh, status and developments regarding the Conservative Leadership Conference. Mike is the Director of Graduate Development here at the Leadership Institute, and he directs our efforts to reach out and develop relationships with graduates uh, from uh, any of our 27 different schools. He is also the coordinator of the 2001 Conservative Leadership Conference. Previously, Mike worked as a regional coordinator in our campus leadership program where he developed independent conservative student uh, organizations. Uh, Mike also serves on the alumni board of the, at the Fund for American Studies. Mike? Good morning. I'm actually very excited to be able to report to you that this year's Conservative Leadership Conference appears as if it might just be the best Conservative Leadership Conference we've ever had. We now have 22 days till the conference. It'll be held October 25th through October 27th uh, here in Arlington, Virginia, actually down in uh, Crystal City at the Hilton. And for those of you that have come to the conference, uh, I, I know that you're excited. Uh, we'll go a little bit over what you'll see there, what you'll expect. For those that have never come to the conference, uh, you can expect to hear from top conservative leaders from all across the movement and all across the country. But unlike some other conferences, you'll actually have the opportunity to get the hands-on, nuts and bolts, political training at this conference that the Leadership Institute has uh, become so well known for. I can tell you we've already confirmed uh, speakers like Senator Mitch McConnell from Kentucky, uh, the new DEA administrator and former uh, Congressman Asa Hutchinson from Arkansas. We have the Majority Whip, Tom DeLay, who's actually going to kick off our morning sessions. Uh, we have Nas the National Review Editor, Rich Lowry, uh, coming to join us. We have uh, Steve Forbes, who's going to address some of the economic aftermath uh, of the terrorist attacks. We have Congressman Bob Barr, John Doolittle, Roscoe Bartlett, former Congressman Bob Dornan. We have uh, Gary Aldrich coming. And frankly, uh, in planning this conference over the past few weeks, obviously uh, everything has changed. Our focus has changed, our emphasis has changed, uh, the tone has changed. We've worked very hard to try to uh, adjust the conference, to revamp the conference, to make it more appropriate, uh, to make it more timely to make it, frankly, more relevant to what's going on in our country. And to that end, uh, our Friday dinner gala at the Conservative Leadership Conference, which is typically uh, a celebration of conservative victories in, in, the, in the preceding year, has been completely changed to become a tribute to all the victims and the heroes of the events of September 11th. Now to that end, We've invited firefighters from New York City, firefighters from Arlington, Virginia. We've invited uh, family members from Flight 93 in Pennsylvania where the passengers fought the terrorists to save those on the ground. And we'll actually be presenting a donation in their name to the charity of their choice uh, as a conference to help their families and support them in the aftermath of these events. We're also excited that our keynote for that evening is a gentleman named Ben Stein. Uh, this is the first time Mr. Stein has ever spoken for us. Uh, he's one of the hottest conservative speakers in any venue. And when he heard what we were doing in terms of a tribute uh, to victims and heroes, uh, Mr. Stein decided to donate his considerable speaking fee and come for free. So. We're excited about this conference. Everyone should have a flyer on your, at your chair. On the back of that flyer is actually a registration form. And I've also included an envelope that you, if you choose to register, and we'd love to have you, you can fill it out, just drop it in the mail. Or we have a brand new website. It's clc2001.com. It has the up-to-date schedule information, uh, registering information. Uh, we're inviting all college students to attend for free this year. Uh, and we're excited at the, at the response so far. 
So if you have any questions at all, uh, I'll be here after the breakfast, and Ellen Ray in the back, uh, which you folks can't see, but she's standing over here in the back, uh, we'll be here to answer any questions anyone has, and we will be very happy to see you on October 25th. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, good report, and you are doing great work with the Conservative Leadership Conference. Now, to introduce our distinguished speaker, I want to present to you Brian Wilkes. He started his professional career in the first Bush administration, working in the White House press office. And following that, he handled media relations with the Department of Agriculture. In 1993, he accepted the position of Deputy Press Secretary for Senator Larry Craig of Idaho, and was pro promoted to press secretary in 1995. And continuing his uh, tradition of working for great members of the Congress, he is now communications director and senior policy advisor to Congressman Ed Royce. Ed, you, have, uh, you, you should know that our policy is always to have the introduction of our speaker given by somebody who is beholden to the speaker so that we know it will be a satisfactory introduction to him. <laughs> Aside from his busy schedule on the Hill, Brian donates a great deal of time to the Leadership Institute as a guest faculty for many of our schools, including our Public Relations School and the Capitol Hill Staff Training School. Brian, come up here and introduce your boss. Thanks, everybody. You know, actually, I, uh, I usually speak in these classrooms when I'm speaking to a lot of the Leadership Institute schools, which is more than this that I've done for many years. And a lot of people ask me to speak a lot of different places about a lot of different subjects. But I tell you, I keep coming back here to the Leadership Institute because of all the great work that Morton's doing and Lou and everybody else. Um, you know, quite frankly, conservatives have to look out for one another. We have to take care of ourselves like the liberals do. And let me give you an example about Major League Baseball. People don't graduate high school and go on to play in the big leagues. They go to what's called a farm team. Now, there's three different levels of these farm teams before you get to the major leagues, where you learn your skills, you learn to play a little bit better, and really prepare for the, for, for the big leagues. And that's what Leadership Institute is. It's a farm team for conservatives. So I appreciate seeing all of you here. I know uh, the staff appreciates you all being here. And I just want to encourage you all to continue supporting Leadership Institute and coming to events like this. Um, now a little bit about Congressman Royce. He's an uh, intellectual giant, a benevolent soul, a man of letters. <laughs> In fact, he may be one of the greatest men ever to come to Washington, D.C. How am I doing so far, boss? <laughs> Get that raise? Okay. Seriously, folks, he's all that. But he was uh, elected to Congress in 1992. He, he hails from Orange County, California. Um, he serves on the House International Relations Committee, where he chairs the Africa Subcommittee. He is uh, an active participant in the Asian Pacific Subcommittee. He is the co-chairman of the Congressional India Caucus. He is the chairman of the U.S.-Korea Parliamentary Exchange. Uh, he serves on the Banking and Finance Committee as well, when he finds the time. And to what's very important to many of us in this room, he is the co-chairman of the Congressional Pork Busters Coalition. So he is constantly on the lookout for wasteful spending and, and uh, different pork that seems to make its way into the budget many, many times. Now, to be honest with you, as I was thinking, you know, what do I say about Congressman Royce? I work for him. Some people may say, some people may think that I'm going to say too little. Some people may think that I'm saying too much. Um, especially at this point. <laughs> but I really decided to put, put all that aside and just tell the truth. And to be honest with you, the truth is, and I don't think he even knows this, but when I was hired by Congressman Royce, I really only saw myself uh, joining this, this uh, member of Congress for a year. I thought I'd stay in the office for about a year. And uh, I'm going on my fifth year now. And that just says something about him, that he's the kind of person, he's the kind of man, the kind of boss that really makes somebody change their career plans. And um, the truth is, is I'm proud to work for him. And 
you all should be proud to have him representing your conservative interests in the Congress. So, Congressman Royce. Thank you very much. Actually, the truth is, when uh, when I hired Brian, he must have been sitting down during the interview. That's, uh, <laughs> let, me, let me lower this microphone here. Uh, thank you all for having me here at the uh, Leadership Institute, and I just want to thank Morton for his for his vision over the years and his dedication. Because you can imagine how important it is to us on the Hill to have uh, these young conservatives come out of uh, what Brian Wilkes called the farm team here. And we appreciate that very much. I also wanted to say hello to Lou Barnett, and uh, I wanted to recognize Lou's good work. We worked together back in the good old days of Ronald Reagan, Lou, in California, and it's good to see you doing the same important work out here in Washington, D.C. Uh, I think it's important uh, that Brian Wilkes has, has dedicated his time over the last eight years, by the way, to working with young people. And, so many uh, interns uh, that we've converted over the years to the conservative cause are because of the time that he spent with, it, with them. And I appreciate the time that every one of you in this room is giving toward this cause of bringing along a new generation of young conservatives. And I want to tell you how important that is. I also want to tell you that, that um, when I was looking for an intern, when I first got to the Hill here, I didn't want any old intern. I wanted a conservative intern. So I contacted this organization, and you sent me Alex Mooney, who now, as you all know, is a state senator here in Maryland. It doesn't take that long for these young conservatives to reach uh, positions of, of importance in the, in the movement. So I just uh, wanted to say it is an honor to speak here at the fountainhead of what's been going on on Capitol Hill in terms of the conservative movement for so long and to recognize your good work. I don't know how many of you, I suspect most of us had a chance to listen to President Bush's uh, remarks. Was, was that not inspiring? Was that not an inspiring speech? And you've probably seen uh, some of the op-eds from former Democrats who converted that night, uh, who have written uh, their mea culpas and said uh, how wrong they were to uh, have tried to prevent George Bush, uh, George Bush uh, from being uh, President of the United States. Uh, I wanted today to talk to you a little bit about foreign policy because it's one area that was neglected. Uh, we all remember the refrain from the Clinton years, it's the economy, stupid, uh, when none of us were supposed to raise the issue of foreign policy. And frankly, I think during the Clinton years what we did was kick the can down the road for eight years for somebody else to deal with the problems. We, we basically ignored foreign policy, we ignored what was going on overseas. I remember five years ago raising in the International Relations Committee the question about, the, about what was happening in Central Asia, what was happening in Afghanistan, and how this was going to be a security threat to the United States. And at the time, uh, I organized a hearing on Afghanistan and on the Taliban, sat down with the Under Secretary of State for Asia and tried to get support for a radio-free Afghanistan, which would begin to broadcast and counter what the Taliban was telling uh, the populace 24 hours a day on their broadcast stations. And of course, ideas have consequences. Bad ideas have very bad consequences. And what the Taliban was spreading through that region, with the help of, uh, of people like bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, that were sort of interlocked. Uh, bin Laden is the son-in-law of uh, the leader of the Taliban, married the daughter of the leader of the Taliban, and he is their secretary basically of defense. He was, he was promoted to uh, head up their defense apparatus at one point. But what transpired during those five years uh, since the Taliban really began to take hold and uh, we did have the opportunity to turn the tide on them had we been able to rally the people of Afghanistan. But we set through, set out that struggle. We allowed them to gain ground. We allowed them to get up on the air with their messages. And if you, if you want an, an understanding of what passes for information in that part of the world, you can follow their broadcast today. Or read the Pakistani newspapers and other newspapers throughout that part of the region. If you'd read them yesterday, you would have found that it was actually the Hindus and the Jews 
that um, helped orchestrate the bombing of the World Trade Center in order to blame it on Al-Qaeda. You would find that the United States had culpability in this, uh, that the United States knew of the bombing, but uh, frankly wanted so badly to go after ben, the innocent bin Laden and Al-Qaeda that uh, we, uh, we allowed the Hindus and the Jews to, uh, to attack uh, the World Trade Center. Now, unfortunately, also, if you read the, the papers here in the United States, read the exit interviews of what people are being told or what people believe, actually believe, in Pakistan. They're believing these news accounts that are circulating in that part of the world. We are not up on the air rebutting this. We are not telling our story. Uh, Biden is right on one point. It is indeed a sorry world when Saddam Hussein, who has starved millions of his people while he has built palaces and built weapons of mass destruction, begins to win the PR war on the issue of who's starving his people, begins to gain credence blaming the United States. Part of the answer to this is information. Information up on the airwaves 24 hours a day. And yesterday I introduced a bill for Radio Free Afghanistan uh, I talked to Chairman Hyde on my committee. He's supporting that measure, and we're going to move it quickly. And the reason we're going to move it is because people there on the ground, the Afghans, the, the Pashtun, need for the first time again since the Cold War, for the first time in 20 years, to hear again from the United States about what's actually happening. Now, we have the Tajiks in the north. We have the Uzbeks, you know, that are in that northern alliance. But the part of that country controlled by the Taliban, is in the grip of the communications network of Taliban radio. We need to use our fighter planes to take out those broadcasting stations. And then we need to go up on the air 24 hours a day. And we have the messages from the former king, the, the Zaire Shah. 86% of the Afghan people still respect the king. He needs to tell them what's happening. Abdul Haq, the commander, the Pashtun commander who fought the Soviets during the Cold War, he's made tapes that can be played to his former troops. We have mullahs who want to talk about how what's in the Quran is not in this false prophet Osama bin Laden's speeches. And I think you know something about the decisions that have been handed down, the fatwas, by uh, bin Laden. Uh, and this, by the way, goes to the issue of the question of American values. You know, we hear on the campuses here in the United States, who are we in the West to try to impose our values on the world? Who are we to speak out? Um, you know, you've read the editorials. You've heard the, the lectures on this subject. I think we need to turn to young women and say this. You know, multiculturalism is all well and good. But let us ask ourselves, if we really believe, if we really believe that a culture is the equivalent of the United States, when young women who are found to have painted their fingernails have those fingernails extracted with pliers, where women are told that they cannot learn to read or write by law, where women, frankly, are stoned if they do not follow the dictates of the Taliban, and have to wear from head to toe this garb when they leave the home, cannot see a physician. The other day I, I learned of, I, I guess she was a repeat offender, but she again, she again, uh, a young woman put polish on her nails. They cut off the ends of her thumbs. Now, these are the actions of the Taliban. And I think on our campuses, we need to ask ourselves, is it time for America to reassert the fact that it is our tolerance of liberty, our tolerance of political pluralism, our tolerance of different religions that frankly make us the object of hatred by people like Osama bin Laden? And isn't it time we feel pride as a nation in the fact that the reason we are being attacked is because we stand for freedom. We stand for freedom. And I, th I think what you see happening in California, Morton made the comment that, you know, we, uh, earlier I think that we, we're seeing more American flags out in California. 
uh, than you are here. Well, it's because in California, for example, up in Berkeley, we know that this is a pitched battle. Up in Berkeley, it's the city manager who ordered the flags taken off the fire trucks, and it's the citizens who finally said enough, you know, and are, and are waving the, the American flag and are rallying for the fact that the United States needs to be unified at this time, needs to, needs to move forward. Another reason why I think it's important that uh, this concept of Radio Free Afghanistan and broadcasting through the Middle East is, is, is as well as is, is important is because I think long term we need to look at some regime changes there. The Taliban has to go. We cannot leave an organization that's allowed terrorist training camps uh, to, be, to be used in order to prepare a team like bin Laden's terrorists. You know, when, ben, when terrorists are on the run, it's hard for them to, to train, it's hard for them to plan, it's hard for them to get the resources. But when a state officially sponsors terrorism, then they can put all of that together. We need to, the president's right, we need to send a message to other states that this will not be tolerated and they will be toppled. And as I've shared with you, the best way to topple the state of, of Afghanistan uh, the Taliban there is to get the support of the people through these radio broadcasts. I think also we need to understand that it's been the lack of focus on international relations over the last eight years that frankly uh, have helped lead to this <coughs> current crisis. And my hope is that many of the young people uh, that are here would consider in the future a career with the American military or with the CIA or the FBI or the State Department because we need our best people, especially solid conservatives in these posts. And I think that um, the American people are coming to appreciate what we as conservatives have understood for a long time and that is that the government's prime responsibility is national defense. And I think uh, the importance of securing the, the home front here can't be understated as well. And Secretary Rumsfeld and Attorney General Ashcroft and others acknowledge that terrorists are still in our country. And I think that's why it's important that the anti-terrorist bill not be gutted. Now, I, I went through my libertarian phase uh, earlier in, in life, and, and I understand uh, the passion of some of the pure libertarians on this and Grover Norquist and so forth in, in trying to attack the anti-terrorist bill. But I will tell you, I've met with former members of the CIA and the FBI and, and followed a little bit what, what went on from the Church Commission onward as we attempted to tie the hands of law enforcement in this country. And I've had former CIA agents tell me that what happened would not have happened had we not tied the hands of law enforcement. And my hope is that we get conservative support for what Attorney General Ashcroft is asking for, because if we go back to the same old rules handed down by, uh, by church, then we're going to end up again with law enforcement lacking the adequate tools. Let me also say on the immigration front, I understand the passion for for, um, uh, you know, uh, illegal immigration in the United States. But again, again, I think it's very important that we, s we admit one fact, and that is illegal immigrants do not have the same rights as U.S. citizens. And when it comes to suspected terrorism, again, this attempt, this libertarian attempt to water down the anti-terrorist bill is in my view misguided. And uh, I say uh, that as one who I think has learned the hard way that uh, the conservatives are right on this. You know, national defense is the first responsibility of the United States government and we haven't taken that seriously enough. So that said, I think uh, we should probably open this up to uh, your questions. And uh, yes, sir. Congressman Royce, I want to ask you about your Radio Free Afghanistan bill. Why do you want to go through uh, Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty and not USIA? And I got another question for Certainly. you. Certainly. Well, let me, let me tell you why. The whole purpose of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, 
was focused on, frankly, changing those governments and bringing freedom uh, to the East Bloc. The team that's, that ran Radio Free Afghanistan during the Cold War, ran it 20 years ago, are still, for the most part, in place over at Radio Free Europe. And if we can take the entity that's already broadcasting into Uzbekistan, into Iran, uh, you see they're already covering territory uh, adjacent to Afghanistan, if we, also Turkmenistan, if we have them do the broadcasting, they're able to get up and running immediately. They understand the mission. Uh, if you'll recall, VOA had a very different broadcast last week. And the debate was their broadcast, they took a like 20 minute interview with the leader of the Taliban. And they, when the State Department asked them not to do it, because the State Department said, listen, you're tax supported. The Board of Governors said, don't, don't do this broadcast, because already they had the reputation over the last few years they've been called Voice of Taliban because they've, they've leaned to that side. They said, no, 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 you know, uh, we've, we've, got to, we've got to give voice to their arguments too. And so um, let's face it, that's, that's a whole different argument. Th that's something for the private sector to do. But what we're talking about now, you see, the mission of Radio Free Europe was to provide the arguments against what totalitarian governments were telling their people, to provide the antidote to that, to walk people through concepts like human rights and political pluralism and economic freedom and, and lead them to the conclusion. How well did it work? We, we know from Vaclav Havel and Lech Valenza, they say that's why Poland's free. That's why the Czech Republic um, uh, got his freedom because people changed their minds on the basis of those broadcasts. We know what works. We know the guys that know how to do it, the young men and women that know how to do it. They're not so young anymore. And they're over at uh, Radio Free Europe. That's why I want to do it through that uh, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. Your, your follow-up question? Well, uh, Voice of America now has cut uh, out broadcast to Western Europe. According to what some of my friends uh, over there tell me, they want to emphasize more broadcasts on Africa and Asia. Now, should the, the government pump more money into Voice America so we could uh, start VOA broadcast to Western Europe and Russia, or should we just... Well, let me tell you, I, I, uh, I carried legislation some years ago for uh, Radio Free Asia, and that legislation, which was signed into law, built the biggest, uh, helped uh, build the biggest uh, transmitter in the world, which is on Tinian Island, we now broadcast uh, day in, day out, 24 hours a day, in all the major dialects, into China, we broadcast into North Korea, uh, into Vietnam. So we're, we're doing that in Asia. And, and yes, we're working on a concept for broadcasts into Africa. But the Radio Free Asia and Radio Free Afghanistan is based on a different concept. That concept is bringing those people around over the next few years so that their attitudes change and countering this, these types of broadcasts I told you about earlier where people are being told, well, it's the Jews and the Hindus and bin Laden is innocent. They're the ones that committed this crime uh, in the United States. I mean, these are, th this is the mission. The mission is one of changing people's attitudes so that they come around to the idea that they want democracy, they want freedom. And we know it works. Yes, sir. In other words, do I endorse the president's position? Yes, but your question is, the president's remark was it's a campaign against global terrorism. If I take him at his word, then 
I am for going against regimes that support terrorism. And let, let me clarify that for you, okay? All right. I think, it's, I think it's very, very important that we focus this effort on toppling the Taliban regime. We need to do that because we know the role they've directly played. When we're done with that, my point is that the best way to affect these other regimes, besides the example that we make out of the, out of the Taliban government of Afghanistan, is radio broadcasts to those citizens so that those citizens understand what their governments are doing and want to change what's happening in their own country. Um, I can give you an example of why I think this two-pronged approach will work. If we look at the action Ronald Reagan took against Libya, uh, in bombing Libya, it not only affected Gaddafi's support for terrorism outside the country, it also had a very real impact on Assad of Syria. What Assad decided after that campaign was that he was not going to export terror to the United States or to Western Europe because he might face the same um, targeting that, that Gaddafi faced. So that approach, removing this government so that other governments know we're serious, you can see it's already gotten traction in Sudan, right? I mean, the Sudanese government is swiftly turning over every terrorist they can find in the country to the United States. Why do you think that's suddenly happened? Because they know that they were culpable in the past, and they're making a clear indication that now they're going to cooperate. That's the kind of cooperation we, we want to see. But long term, what we want to do is actually bring about a change in these governments and offset or counter the political propaganda that are being force-fed through government control and monopoly of their radio stations there and their television stations to the people. The best way to do that is via information. So that's, that's my, I guess, concise enough explanation. Uh, yes, Martin. Um, we all know that many members of the Congress have been hostile uh, to what we would consider adequate defense. They've militantly opposed uh, ballistic missile defense and a great number of other military uh, preparedness issues. Uh, I'm wondering if you could give us a feel for uh, what those long-time proponents of what we would say is an inadequate defense, how are they reacting when you deal with them? How are they reacting in the current situation? Morton, that's a good question. One of the, one of the bills that was put forward yesterday was uh, an Institute for Peace. Wasn't that the, uh, the uh, measure? I think there's some 50 co-sponsors uh, for the Institute of Peace. And I, I, the argument was made if we just had this five years ago, uh, we wouldn't have had this bombing today. So, Morton, there, the position of some is that uh, we need to set up institutions uh, devoted specifically to peace and that somehow that's going to pr protect uh, us from this kind of attack in the future. Uh, I think most of the members of Congress, however, have reached the conclusion that it was the fact that we stripped the Central Intelligence Agency of the ability to recruit out of terrorist organizations by uh, rules that were promulgated uh, that made it impossible basically uh, to recruit spies on the ground, that it was the fact that we tied the hands of the FBI and the CIA uh, in a way that allowed them not to intercept, that we put rules on the INS that uh, basically did not allow INS data to be shared in the proper ways with our intelligence networks so that we couldn't uh, follow suspected terrorists who were here in the country illegally, that all of these actions, uh, as well as the fact that in the past we failed uh, to eliminate bin Laden when he took the following steps. I mean, first, think about this in terms of how we empowered, how we empowered a terrorist. We go down the list of attacks against our barracks, knocking out two of our embassies, attack on the coal. It's no wonder that when the radio of the Taliban says that this man's invincible, it's no wonder that people started to believe it after, after uh, five or six years because the United States did not take any effective action against him. As we read the papers this morning, 
Uh, we learned that the Sudanese tried to uh, hand him over to us and we couldn't figure out how to uh, accept him several years ago, how to get the Saudis to uh, allow him to uh, get into the, be passed into their control. We find out that we had uh, worked out an agreement with Sharif of uh, uh, Pakistan, the former uh, elected leader of Pakistan, but that um, uh, he, he was supposed to have his troops catch bin Laden for us. We weren't able to do it, so, but unfortunately his government fell, and so that fell through. Now is the time to show that we are, in fact, that we do have this resolve, that we are going to topple the Taliban for their support of terrorism, that we're going to bring a new government to power, and that we're going to root out not just bin Laden, but his lieutenants, not just the top three guys, root out the whole network. When that's done, when that's done, people will say, well, far from being invincible, uh, this guy brought down destruction on himself and all who supported him. And then I think the reaction will be the same as Assad, uh, the older's reaction, Assad the first's reaction when he saw what happened with the attack on Gaddafi. He's, the, you know, leaders around the world that support terrorism will then take a step back and the world will be safer. Yes, sir. I was just curious to know when you mentioned bringing a new government what role you think the king of Afghanistan in exile could or should have in not only sort of bringing down the Taliban, but maybe returning to Afghanistan? I know that he's I, I've met the king in, in king. yeah, I've, I've sat down with the king in, in Rome and, and gone through uh, his plan for Aloya Jirga. And I think it's rooted in Afghan history. The concept is that you send Afghans uh, from every tribal group to the General Assembly, their Aloya Jirga, to meet in tandem to select their government. That's the way it was done for a thousand years. And, and to get back to the roots of that, where there's participation by every local com uh, community and province, uh, I think has great advantage. Secondly, the fact that he's willing to serve out a term and not pass this on to his lineage, that he's basically saying, if I take this responsibility, it's only for a few years until the, the new government uh, uh, gets settled and I'm just basically a figurehead. I think that's helpful. And lastly, uh, I think the fact that the Pashtun, the major ethnic group in the country, rever uh, support him. Uh, that's, that's something of a counterweight to the Northern Alliance, who are Tajik and Uzbek. And I, I think it pulls the whole country together long enough. Now, we need to go back into Afghanistan very quickly. We need to play a role in creating stability there when this government's gone. We've got to learn from this example. You know, Nietzsche's wrong out of, uh, order does not come out of chaos. This is the kind of thing that comes out of chaos. We have to reestablish some measure of order and rule of law in, uh, in Afghanistan. Yes, ma'am. I, I have heard from the French, and I just want to add that how rich you are, what you are telling us now, and everybody should take it very seriously. I was still in Hungary, of course, at the end of the last war, Hopefully, and we were listening to the worst of America. We don't windows, everything, but during the German occupation, then the Russian liberation, and but it was like a daily gospel. Everybody was listening to me, mm -hmm. the time, the time, everybody was there and, and listening to me. And then when I was, thank God, already here, from 53 to 63, I worked for the worst of Oh, you did? Hungarian, yeah, Hungarian section. And how much feedback I got still, it was difficult still communicate with them because I didn't want to have a direct connection with Hungary. But I still got that feedback, you know, how much they were listening. They recognized my voice and everything. Yeah. So people were listening to it, and they are doing it everywhere. So it's very important. Well, thank. let me thank you for the role you played in helping liberalize Eastern Europe. Many ple people played a role, and thank you for the role you played with respect to Hungary. Yes, sir, one last question. Well, Congress, instead of the idea of anti-terrorism, the lab would serve me as much as the idea of the President proposing a Homeland Security Cabinet level agency. It seems like we've already got something for Homeland Security called the Department of Defense, and a coordinating agency as a National Security Council. I mean, this is, we haven't declared war on terrorism, so how are we going to ever know when this war is over with, and then we're going to hand this Homeland Security Agency over to a bunch of liberals, maybe down the line. That, that's more my concern. What's, what's you, know, you know, perhaps uh, 
perhaps at some point, um, your, your, your point especially on a declaration of war, perhaps at some point uh, the, the Taliban uh, continues to refuse to hand over bin Laden. Perhaps at some point uh, the United States will decide on a formal declaration of war uh, and, uh, and make the point crystal clear. Uh, but you raise some important concerns with respect to the homeland defense, and uh, uh, let's see if that's sunset. Uh, that's that's uh, a very good point. Well, again, I thank you all for the opportunity to speak to you today, and if anybody else has any additional questions, maybe I could take them afterwards. And one last time, let me just uh, thank Morton for what I think in, the, in terms of this long struggle for freedom and for the conservative cause. Uh, the most important role is played by those that are making converts to our cause and bringing up a new generation of young conservatives, and you have done that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, uh, I knew that we were making the right decision by inviting Congressman Royce here. He is truly outstanding, uh, and uh, we, we consider you to be one of the new generation of conservative leaders in the country, and we are very delighted that you honored us with your presence today and as a memorial of your uh, little remembrance of your uh, trip here, we, let me present to you uh, a uh, brand new Adam Smith tie of the well, green, de green design. I, I can use that. I appreciate that very Great. much. Great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. I invite you all to join us Wednesday, November 7th. Our next breakfast of the Wednesday Wake Up uh, Club will be then, and our special guest will be the very interesting and, uh, and brilliant Dr. Wendy Graham of the Mercatus Center. She happens also to be the wife of Senator Phil Graham. Uh, those of you who are here who would like a tour of the Leadership Institute will please uh, meet over by the camera there with Anne Marie Mullen. Anne Marie, where are you? There, or Anne Marie's over there. Work your way up here, Anne Marie. Anyone wishing for a, a tour? We are always pleased to have you go through. If you toured it once before, you, you might want to come by and see how we're doing, what the changes are. She will depart immediately uh, upon the adjournment. Uh, if, if, for those of you who want a tour, we're happy to see you come around. I'll probably be in my office and greet you again then. All right, thank you all and uh, hope to see you again soon.